Well, welcome to this tutorial which is going to look at parenting. Parenting is a way of relating the transforms of one object here at the scene level to the transforms of another object. And quite often you want to do that as part of animation. And indeed it's absolutely essential as a preparation for rigging. I'm not going to go into rigging in this tutorial, but uh, we'll lay the groundwork here for some of the concepts that uh, you'll need to understand in order to start learning about rigging. Just a quick remark that you can of course animate things here at the geometry level. Uh, for example, I could lay down a transform node here and transform one of the faces of this box and animate that transform. But you only generally want to do that, to animate here at the geometry level, if you're changing the points of an object relative to other points in the object. There's no point here, if I lay down a transform, in transforming, in general, all of these points at once. If I want to just move my box around, and perhaps animate it moving around, I should do that at the scene level. And that's what we're going to be doing uh, today. So let's have a look in a bit more detail at these transform parameters here. If I want to transform something at the scene level, I need to put my cursor over the 3D view and hit enter. And two things happen. One is that this button here, uh, this handles button, is lit. And we get some handles inside the 3D view which allow us to move the object around. And if we use the lower case Y key, we can cycle between the available sets of handles. Translation, rotation, scaling. And of course, I can animate this. So I'm going to Alt-Left-Click here on the label to set a keyframe. Let's move to frame 10, move our box around a little bit, like so, and then Alt-Left-Click again. And that's keyframed. So as we can see, the box moves. Let me say a quick word about the pre-transform. So let me delete these channels and revert back to defaults. And by default my box is at the origin and these have a nice clean value of 0 and a scale of 1 throughout. What happens if I in fact want my box to say be over here? And I want to start animating it from here. Well we can see we've got some parameters here in our translation. Uh, because I've moved the box. And that's all very well, be but it can cause some difficulties because, for example, if I were to animate up to here and then decide that I didn't want to do that, and I want to get back to the sort of home position of this box, if I right-click and revert to default, I get back to the origin, not back to where we started over here. And one of the things you can do about this is to use the pre-transform. So here we can see we've got some values in our translate parameter. And if I go up to the pre-transform here and select clean translates, we can see this reverts to zero. And I can move my box around and then if I revert to defaults, it actually goes back to here. So what's going on? Well, the translation values we had in here are not actually being forgotten they're being stored in another transformation which is hidden from view and which is applied before we apply the transformations here and that's called the pre-transform I can actually see what my pre-transform is by selecting extract pre-transform and we can see we get back our translation I can also with it extracted reset the pre-transform that's going to mean that the pre-transform revert back to unit values. So let's clean that again. What happens now if I want to rotate my box? Well we can see that it rotates around the new origin that we set earlier. So it doesn't rotate here, it rotates about the origin that's been set once the pre-transform has been applied. So that can be quite useful too. Let me get, of, get rid of that pre-transform. Let's extract it 
and reset it. And I'm going to reset this to defaults. It's worth noting that the order in which you apply transformations is pretty important. Again, let's move my box over here. If I then rotate, you can see it rotates around the center of the box. If I, but I was to change my transformation order so that it started with the translation, for example, translation, scale, and rotation, and I then rotate, you can see that my box is rotating around the origin rather than around its own center. So the transformation order is pretty important for determining how these transforms affect your box. Let's now look at parenting. And I'm going to revert this back to defaults. And I'm going to introduce a sphere into my scene. And let's move it a little bit away from the box. And we've seen already that we can apply more than one transformation to an object. If we have something stored in the pre-transform, then that's applied first. And then whatever is here is applied. In fact, you can stack up as many transformations as you like and apply them to the object. And this is what lies behind parenting. You achieve parenting by connecting the output of one object here at the scene level to another. So let's connect the box to the sphere. We can see uh, that nothing has changed for the moment. Uh, but when we move the box object, the sphere now moves with it. And the reason for that is that because we've parented the sphere to the box, the transformation of the box is being applied to the sphere before it's pre-transform and before any transformations that are in here. So in other words, anything that we now do here is, sorry, anything we now do here, for example, changing this, is relative to the origin of uh, the box. We can also rotate uh, the box. Let's try doing that. And we can see that both the box and the sphere rotate. In fact, you can stack up a long chain of parenting relationships between objects, and we'll see an example of that later on. I want to talk a bit now about some other things that you can do with transforms. We've had a look already at how you can use the pre-transform to make these values revert to zero while maintaining the position of the object. Another way to do this is to use the freeze tool here. This only works with the transforms here. It won't work, for example, if you've animated your object along a path. So we select the Freeze tool on the Modify tab. We then select the object to apply it to and hit Enter. <coughs> and we can see that our Translate has gone back to zero. Uh, our Pivot has changed uh, because we will still need to maintain this pivot for rotations. Uh, but if we dive inside, we now see that we've got a transform node here, which has the transformations that were previously at the geometry level, uh, rather at the scene level, now captured here at the geometry level. There is another way to uh, do that. Let me delete this. And revert this to defaults. What happens if we've got some animation here at the scene level? And let me give this some animation. Which we want to exist uh, inside a bit of geometry with no transformations at the scene level. So let me lay down a geometry note. So let's delete this. What happens if we wanted to bring the animation on this box object here into a geometry level and then use it? Well, the answer is to use an object merge. And 
instead of having the transform into the specified object, we say into this object. And then we select the box object. And we can see that even within this object here, let's uh, switch off the view of it at the higher level. So within this object here, it's animated. So we've in fact imported from the scene level the animation down to the geometry level. How would you do the reverse? That is, you've got some animation at the geometry level and you somehow want to bring it up to the scene level. Well, let's demonstrate how to do that. So let's look at another example where we may want to bring animation, or transformations rather, up from the geometry level and use them at the scene level. I've got two objects here. I've got my box and I've got a teapot. And I've animated the top of the box so that it moves up. The teapot's resting on the box at the beginning. But as we can see, the box just goes straight through it as it's animated. How are we going to get the teapot so that it stays on top of the box? Well, you might say, well, let's try parenting the teapot to the box. But that doesn't have any effect. And the reason for that, of course, is that there's no animation here at the scene level. It's all happening at the geometry level. So parenting isn't going to work. We could bring the teapot in here and apply the same transformation to the teapot and merge the results, uh, but there are often good reasons for keeping separate objects separate. For example, I may want to apply different material to each of these objects. So I need to find a different solution. Well, this is where the rivet tool comes in. So let me just hide my teapot for a second and deselect my box. And let's select the rivet tool and it asks me to select the object to attach to, which is going to be my box. And then it asks me to select some points for attaching the rivet object. And I usually want to select three points uh, because three points can define a plane and therefore an orientation. So let's select three of the points on the top of our box and hit enter. And we see that we get this rivet node. And what the rivet node does is it takes uh, the object and a set of points and converts that into a transformation. And we'll be able to see in a minute that we will be able to use this to parent our teapot to. Uh, let me show the teapot. Now we've got a problem. If we just connect these two, we can see the teapot shoots off over the side. We don't want that, so let's undo that. And the reason that's happening is because we don't have keep position when parenting set to true. That means that when we parent the teapot to anything else, these transforms may change. When, in fact, we want uh, them to stay the same, we want this to be exactly where it is after the parenting operation, but thereafter to move with the rivet. So let's select keep position with parenting connect the two, and what we should now find is if as the top of the box moves up, so does our teapot. And that's because the teapot is riveted to those points on the top of the box. Note that you don't have to use three points to define an orientation. You can also use up and normal point attributes and use a single point and use those attributes to determine the orientation of your transformation. I'm not going to demonstrate that now. Let's have a look at another method of attaching or parenting an object to a point on the surface of another object rather than just to the object itself. So I've got a grid object here and I've given it some UV coordinates and then I've edited it to make it uh, a bit more interesting as a surface. And let's lay down uh, a box or something like that. And what I want to do is have the box move about on the surface that we've defined here with this grid. And I can do this using the sticky tool. So let's select sticky. And 
I can then select the object we want to stick to and I can then shift select to move that position and we can see let's, let's leave it there for the moment and we can see what we get here is a sticky node and a sticky node is taking an object is taking some UV coordinates and by default they're the standard UV attribute and it's then taking a position defi defined by that U and V and it's using that to calculate an orientation and a position which we can then use to parent something to. So let's put our box object. Uh, before I do that I'm going to keep position when parenting. Uh, rather I don't actually want that on because I want the box to move to the surface. So let's have a look and we can see that uh, it's now moved to that point we'd earlier chosen. And if I move it up rather in the I think in the Z axis, if I move it up to point five, we can see now it's sitting on the surface. And I can change these uh, UV coordinates. In fact I can choose another shift click to choose another place on the surface and as you can see this is with the sticky node selected uh, our box moves and you can even animate uh, these so I can start with a U position like so move to frame 10 shift select somewhere, somewhere else and then alt left click again and what we should see is that that position changes so this allows you to animate an object traveling across the surface of another object now there are several other ways to do this but this is one of the most convenient now sometimes you may want to parent an object to something but you don't have another object in your scene that serves the purpose this is where the null object comes in and I can create one here on the create tab like so let me hit enter to put it at the origin and a null object is exactly like any other object except that it won't render uh, and we can see that there's a little symbol here it looks like a set of axes and in fact we can change that here on the miscellaneous tab by choosing a different type of control so we can say let's have some circles or we can have some planes or we can have null and circles or we can have null and planes and so on and we can choose which planes we have. We have just the X and the Z planes, like so. Uh, we can have two planes, like so, and so on. This is just a, a symbol, so this doesn't affect how the null operates, it, it just affects how it's displayed. And we can parent things to the null, like so, and then we can move the null and the other object will travel with it. And when we get on to talking about rigging, uh, we make a very great deal of use of nulls because they're extremely useful as ways to give yourself handles to deform much more complicated geometry. So let's move on to a much more complicated example which is going to look at multiple parenting relationships and also how we can animate parenting relationships over time. So I've got a set of objects here and each of these is in fact just a geometry node with a file import. Uh, the project file is available and I will also put up uh, the project file showing how each of these bits of geometry is built but for the moment we don't need to look at that, we just need to look at these objects and they're in fact it's rather a jumble of objects. I'm going to turn the display of some of these off. I'm going to turn the apple and the arm off and the wire the seal and that's it I think. So what we've got first of all is a sort of pincer object here and it's got three parts. Uh, there's something called the sleeve, there's something called the thumb and there's something called the point. And the reason I've split it into three objects is because I want to use a different shader ultimately to shade each of these three. 
Now, at the moment, if I was to take this uh, point object, for example, and move it, it moves completely independently of the other parts. And the same is true, for example, of the sleeve. In order to avoid this, I'm going to parent these together. So let's ensure that in each case uh, we have keep position when parenting selected. And the point is in fact the last object. The thumb is in the middle and the sleeve is at the top. Because I want this to be able to rotate around the sleeve. So I want the sleeve to govern the motion of everything else. So let's parent the sleeve, uh, the thumb to the sleeve, and then the point to the thumb. And now what should happen is if I move the if I move the sleeve, everything else moves with it. But we'll have noticed a problem there, which is that if there's a sort of pincer, we probably want it rotating around here, not around this point here. So I need to try and move this pivot over to here. And I can do that by ensuring that the object whose pivot I want to move is selected. And then if I press the insert key on my keyboard, as you can see, the handle uh, goes into a sort of wireframe pattern. And there are some translate handles here, which allow me to move it somewhere a bit more like where I might want it. Let's try that. And then if I hit Insert again, we can see that the pivot point has changed. And what this means is that when I rotate this, it's going to rotate around that point rather than where it was before. Let's now have a look at this claw uh, in relation to the arm. And we can see at once that the claw is in the wrong place. It should fit into this slot here. So let's select the sleeve, to which everything else is now parented. And let's move it down into the slot. But we can see it's a little bit too big for the slot. It's bulging out here. Uh, so I'm probably going to want to scale it down. And you can see as I scale the sleeve, Everything else is also scaled. That's looking a bit better now. Let's move it back a little bit. I mentioned earlier that it's often a good idea to try and zero out all of these values. And I can do that by selecting Clean Transform. And we can see everything apart from the pivot has now been set to zero. So I can rotate this like this and then revert to defaults. So that's sorted out one claw, but clearly we probably want a second claw over here. Uh, let me start by taking these three nodes that form the one claw and renaming them. And I can do that by selecting them and then clicking somewhere on the background here. And I get a rename option. And I want to rename them as right like so. And this new prefix will be added to every single one of these notes. So let's rename that. And we can see they're all now named right. Right sleeve, right thumb, and right point. And with them still selected, I want to create a mirror image here, which is going to form the other claw. And I can do that using the mirror tool on the modify shelf. So let's select that. Uh, I've already got the objects I want selected. So it's producing this, and I just have to hit Enter. And we can see it's created another three nodes, like so. Uh, and I'm going to need to rename these two. So let's select them, right-click on Empty Space, Rename. And I'm going to call these Left. And we've got Remove Old Prefix selected here. This is going to remove everything up to the underscore. So it's going to remove the word Mirror from each of these objects, and it's going to replace it with a new prefix, which is left, like so. Now, obviously, at the moment, uh, there's a problem, because my arm 
this is not connected to my claws, so if I try and move that, the claws are not moving with it. So I need to parent my arm to both of my claws, like so. So that when I move the arm, the claws are going to move with it. I also want a control to control the claws gripping something. Well, let's start by encapsulating all of these nodes into a subnetwork so that they're going to be easier to handle. So let me select them all. And then again, clicking on empty space, I can select collapse. And we can see these are all collapsed into a subnet, which I'm going to call arm. Now, a subnet is slightly like parenting in that it has a set of translations and rotations and so on here which apply to all uh, the objects inside the net. Uh, but you can run into problems if you were, for example, to let's lay down a null and then parent like so uh, the null to the arm uh, we would find that for some reason the null moving around has no effect on the arm. And the reason for that is that you do need to go in to the subnetwork and make sure that your first input here is connected and we then find that the parenting works properly. Uh, let me undo that because I want to take away that parenting. But make sure that this is connected. So we've now got an arm uh, neatly encapsulated in this subnetwork. And what I'm going to do here is use the menu up here to edit the parameter interface and I'm going to add another float parameter here to the transform tab. Let's sorry, let's put it as part of the transform tab and I'm going to call it close, let's say. And let's give it a range of minus 20 to 20. And the default value is going to be 0, which is fine. So this gives us this control here. If I right click here and copy this parameter, uh, we can take it and we can paste it into the Y rotation of each of these. So paste copied relative reference into the Y rotation here and paste copied relative reference into the Y rotation here. And what this should mean is that, ah, no, we can see that they don't do what we expect. So one of these is going to have to be negative. Let's see, is it this one? Let's have a look. Let's go up, try this. There we are. So that now operates as a control to bring our claws together. There are a couple of other things that need to be parented to our arm, however, uh, because we've also got some wire and a seal. So I can join this all together like so. And it should ensure that when we view these, uh, they all move together as the arm moves, like so. So we've now created a hierarchy of nodes. And we've got a container here with some geometry nodes in it. And this is parenting to a couple of other geometry nodes. And you can often get quite a complex layering of nodes when you're building up a complex model. And just as a side, I'm going to demonstrate one of the other nodes that you get here on the parenting menu of the tab menu, 
and that's the fetch node and what fetch allows me to do is to fetch the transform of an object that doesn't exist at this level of the scene but is perhaps buried here in a subnetwork. So let's fetch the transform of the left point. Like so. And we want to in fact use the parent transform of the fetched object. And we do want to fetch the subnet transform and we want to then let's display this apple and I'm going to move it slightly out of the way I'm going to clean, clean those translates and I'm going to make sure it's going to keep its position when it's parenting and I'm going to parent it to the fetch and what we should find now is that as we open and close the claws, the apple goes with the claw. So that's the use of the fetch node, but I'm not in fact going to need it in this scene. Now I want to do a little bit of cleaning up before we go on to parenting the apple to our arm. So let me take these two, which I left out of the subnet, and I'm going to control C, dive into the subnet, and then control V and they will be parented to the arm there and we can delete them here. Now it's important that we set up our arm geometry. We're going to have two arms so that uh, they don't cause the apple to move when it's parented to them. And the reason for that is that we're going to use a blend parent node to blend between two different objects that are parenting. So we want the apple to be at the origin. So let's get rid of all of this, revert this all back to defaults. Make sure we don't have any pre-transform. So let's also revert that back to defaults. Like so. And that now is sitting at the origin. So we need our claws to be position so that they could grasp this when it's at the origin. Now what we could do is move our arm like so at the subnet level. But what we'll find, let me turn off keep position with parenting, is that when we then parent our apple it moves. What we need to do is instead go inside the arm and move uh, this arm node here. In fact, let's rename this to avoid confusion. Let's call this arm geometry. And we need to move this. Let's just revert this translation to defaults. What we need to do is move the arm geometry itself Oops. so that this pincers are more or less surrounding the origin, like so. And then we should find that when we parent the apple to the arm, it doesn't move, like so. We're going to need two arms, so I'm going to call this, say, right arm. And then I'm going to control C, control V, to produce a copy, which I'm going to rename left arm. And what we want to do is parent the apple to both of these arms. But first of all, I need to move this left arm, and I need to rotate it 180 degrees so that it occupies the opposite direction to the first arm. And I'm going to move one arm so that it's slightly let's move the one arm so that it's slightly above the other one. And the other one that's a bit too far. And the other one slightly down.
like so. So that they don't actually overlap. And I'm now going to introduce some animation, which I will do uh, with the video paused and then come back. Well, let's have a look at that animation. So what happens as I scrub the timeline is that the left hand arm comes in then the right arm comes in. The claws of the right hand arm collapse and grip the apple and the claws of the left hand arm open up and then both arms withdraw. And of course what I'm seeking to achieve here is the left hand arm bringing on the apple and then handing it over to the right hand arm which carries it off. And to do that we're going to need to blend between parenting to the left arm at the beginning of our sequence and to the right arm at the end of our sequence. Before I demonstrate how to do that, I want to take a quick look at how parenting works with a subnet. So let me parent my apple to this subnet, but first of all I'm going to keep position when parenting. And we can see now as the timeline moves that the apple is linked to this right arm. And what's happening here is that it is getting the transform set here and it's set uh, in the normal way as the parent transform of the apple. That isn't necessarily always uh, what you want. And there's a setting here on the subnet uh, tab which allows you to say which object is going to control the movement of the child object. And by default we've got it at input object 1 now. That means it'll take whatever transform is applied into this input here. So another way of doing our animation would have been to have a null object here as the parent of the subnet, leave the subnet with no transforms on it whatsoever, and animate the null. And then we would find that the transforms on the null would be passed straight through to the apple. Because we don't have anything connected to input 1, in fact what's happening is it's using these transforms here as the parent transform. And indeed you can set that explicitly using no object, which has the same effect. Or you can choose one of the objects which is contained in the subnet and make that, uh, in effect, the parent of the child node here. So let me turn it back to no object. And let's do the same with this one. Now, when we're going to blend the parenting of an object, we have to make sure that at the point, uh, if we're going to have an instantaneous transfer from one object to the next, we've got to make sure that at the point at which the transfer takes place, the transforms on these two objects are the same. They don't have to be the same throughout our sequence, but at the point where the transfer takes place, the transforms on these two objects have to be the same, otherwise the apple would jump from one place to the other. Well, the way to animate the parenting of an object is to use a blend node. And we can connect both of our objects into the blend node. And then we can parent our apple to that. Now, the blend node has a number of different modes of operation. We're going to use the blend tab here. You can equally well use the Sequence or Constrain tab, which allow you to blend using a single control between the various inputs connected here, uh, or in this case to jump from one to the next as soon as it reaches the right value. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail. The Blend uh, option allows you to do two things, one of which is to blend between the parents, and the other is to control which of the transforms on these parents is inherited by the child. And as we will see later, that's extremely useful. So what we do want to do is we want to start off with the apple parented to the right arm, sorry, the left arm over here. So I reduce this weight to zero and have this as a weight of one. So let's out left click both of these. And then we bring in the arm and we can see that there's a bit of a problem here. We're going to need to adjust uh, the height of our apple. 
in order for it to not... Apple seems to have got some transforms on it. Let's just get rid of those. There we are. That's better. So we start off like that, uh, and then at a certain frame, this other arm comes in, and at that point there, around frame 35, we want the parenting to change. So at frame 35, let's keyframe this again. And then at frame 36, let's reverse these so that this has a weight of 1 and this has a weight of 0. And alt left click again. And let's just see what's happening now. Let's have a quick look at this. And as we step through, we can see that the apple is doing two things, in fact. Uh, and we can see this more clearly if we change this. It spins round and it drops as we transfer between the two parents. And the reason it's doing that is because we don't actually have the same transforms on both of these at frame 35. We can see that the left arm has a small translation value in the Y axis, and it has a rotation of 180 degrees. And this has a small negative transformation in the Y axis, and it has a rotation of zero. So when the apple is handed over, it's going to rotate 180 degrees, and it's going to drop from plus 0.2 to roughly minus 0.2. So we're going to end up with this sudden movement, and that's no good. Now, in fact, all we need to happen in this animation is for the Z position of the apple to change. So what we can do to solve this is we can turn off all of these buttons, like so, apart from TZ. And that will mean that our apple is just going to be animated the parenting, rather, is just going to work for the transform in the translate Z direction. And there we can see that the apple is now being handed over properly. Well, I want to end by talking you through this parenting.final.hip file, which is the file that's set up for rendering. And the first thing to note is that we've got a compositing network here, which imports the three textures that are provided, and which are in JPEG format, and converts them into .rat format, RAT format, which is the most efficient format for using as a texture for Mantra. In the object network, the only things we've got that are new are a backdrop. Let's have a look at that. It's a fairly standard shaped plane like this, which provides nice reflections and a nice backdrop to your scene. And it's quite common uh, to use this in renders. I've also got an area light, uh, which is set up just to the back of the camera, and that gives nice reflections on our shiny materials here. And it's a nice big square. And then I've got an environment light set up with a texture which I've called sky, but in fact just a random set of blue uh, and black patches, which just provide something interesting for the materials here to reflect and to influence the lighting. Now let's have a quick look at the output network. And it's just got two nodes, both of which are PBR setups. And the PBR rendering engine, which is set here, is set to micropolygon physically based rendering. And the reason we're doing that is because we are going to use, at least on the main render here, uh, motion blur. And I've upped the pixel samples to 5x5. Five five, and I'm using a fairly high value for min ray samples. And as you will recall, for PBR renders, min-ray samples tells you the maximum number of samples of the environment that will be taken 
for any one point in the render. And the ray variance anti-aliasing doesn't actually have any effect. It's, it's just this min ray samples parameter that has an effect. And for both of these, we're going to render to a file. Where is it here? So I'm rendering out to final.f.pick. So just clicking render on this will render out the entire sequence. Uh, it'll take a certain amount of time because uh, we are using PBR. Finally, let me talk about the materials that we've got set up here. These are all standard materials from the material palette. I've got a rubber material, which is just a clay material with a dark grey base colour. The backdrop has a light blue clay material. Uh, the apple is just a basic surface with displacement. And I've got a colour map for the surface of the apple. And I've got a di displacement set up with a very small scale. And I've got a displacement map here. Now notice that on the properties tab here we can set the displacement bound which is the overall scale and we can also set something called true displacements and by default this is enabled uh, and that means we would get real deformation of the geometry at render time according to the displacement map. I've turned it off so that's only just going to perturb or change the normals of our surface. It's not going to actually displace the surface and that's faster for a PBR or ray tracing type render. And we've got some glass which is just used for the wires that come out of the top of the arms. We've got some chrome which is being used for the pincers and usually want to turn the reflection intensity down somewhat and I've also increased the blurriness just a little bit to give it a slightly more realistic reflection. And then the reflective material is the main material we're using for the plastic on the arms. And here I'm using a fairly rough uh, U-value to produce a broad highlight. And then the reflections I've got set to a fairly low intensity and with quite a lot of blurriness, a cone angle of 5. And that reminds me of one other thing that I've done here on the render nodes, which is to add a parameter uh, which you need to add up here and you'll have a, if you have a look at my PBR videos you can see how to do this, uh, but you need to add a parameter called color limit. And normally this has a value of a thousand and what that can do is really blow out uh, the reflections of your area light and they look uh, really pretty bad. If you lower this down to something nearer 5, 10 or 20, you get a much better render. So I'm going to finish now by just leaving you with that sequence rendered out.